people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. start with this, it appears that former WBC light flyweight champion Kim Clavel of Canada is set to return to action and she's got not just one, but two fight dates in the books. Two fight dates on schedule, one in early April, then the other in May. With both fight dates spaced so close together, you can make the inference that her very next fight is going to be an easy one, a tick over, a rebound fight to get her back in the winner's bracket as she is rebounding off her split decision loss, loss. to one of only two champions at this weight, Evelyn Bermudez. She fought in October of last year in what was her bid to not just become a two-time light flyweight champion, but a unified champion overall. She's not having much luck in that department. There are two champions at this weight, and all four alphabet titles are split between them. There's Mexico's own Jessica Niri Plata, who Kim fought in January of last year, and there is Argentina's own Evelyn Bermudez, who she also fought in October. She didn't have any luck with either of them. There is a legitimate argument that she was a woman hard done in her last fight, the fight with Evelyn Bermudez, that she did enough to win a decision, but for some reason, she didn't get that consideration on the judges' scorecards, which is peculiar because the fight happened in Canada, and Kim Clavel, she's from Canada, she's based out of there, she was the house fighter, it was her promoter staging the show, and for some reason, Evelyn Bermudez got the nod. She got the decision where it was widely perceived that Kim Clavel did enough to win the fight. It's quite uncommon that the hometown fighter and the house fighter ends up being the fighter that gets screwed, yeah. that gets jobbed yeah. on the cards, but that is more or less what happened, the overall perception of Kim Clavel's last fight with Evelyn Bermudez. I don't know if she's going to pursue a rematch. But the next two fights are at light flyweight, where those fights took place. The next two fights are at light flyweight, so it doesn't look like she's leaving the division. It doesn't look like she's moving up. And both fights are Yvonne Michelle promotions. Her longtime promoter, Yvonne Michelle, who's promoted quite a few successful Canadian fighters, some of them females, like Marie Yves Decare, Marie Pierre Huel, unbeaten up and comer, Carolyn Veer, and of course, former champion Kim Clavel set to go down in Quebec Canada as an Yvonne Michelle promotion as stated she doesn't appear to be leaving the division she doesn't appear to be moving up in weight so I'm going to assume that she might pursue a rematch with one of the two champions at this weight either Jessica Niri Plata or Evelyn Bermudez and I think the Evelyn Bermudez fight that rematch is a lot more winnable than the Plata fight Evelyn ain't as hard a puncher as Jessica Niri Plata. She's not as hard a puncher, she's more beatable, and by all rights, Kim already beat her. She just got screwed on the cards. Perhaps the itinerary is, she has a tune-up fight in April, en route to a rematch with Evelyn in May. Maybe that's how they're gonna do it. I'm not sure, but because she's still campaigning at this weight, I'm going to assume she's gonna want a rematch with one of those champions. Yeah. The two fights that she has on schedule are both registered as light flyweight contests scheduled for 10 rounds. We'll see what happens. Kim Clavel is best described as a mid-range to inside combination puncher. Very fast one. Doesn't pack the biggest punch. She's not the strongest, but she's fast. I suppose the only real indictment against Kim is that sometimes she spends a little bit too much time in the pocket. That's what costed her the Plata fight. She's got very fast hands and two good legs under her. Good movement good feet and for the most part she is defensible she just sits in the pocket a little bit too long at times let's see what improvements she's made in april god have plan i don't know procent i believe so 100 percent uh, not 100 percent 17 <laughs> but uh, i know uh, it will be well, Usyk also claimed he could beat not one, not two, 
but three Tyson Furies. If the fight does take place, the winner will be crowned the first undisputed heavyweight champion of the world since Lennox Lewis was back in 2000. I just the, looked, uh, uh, looked back big, uh, for the all kind of uh, things that I went through. Morning hours where I woke yeah, up, the uh, sparring partners, uh, the kilometers that I run, uh, all the exercises I've done, and I thought, wow, what a tremendous job I have done. When I, with the help of God, will complete all the assignments, I can easily take three Tyson, Tyson Furies. We can take him at a time or we can take one uh, Saturday, Sunday and the third on Monday. Don't be afraid. I will not leave you alone, my friend. Very determined, Oleksandr Yusik, who still has his eyes on the prize, reminding Tyson Fury that he's not going anywhere. He's not going away. He's not going to leave him alone. He still wants that last brass ring. He wants to become this division's undisputed champion. When you surmise Oleksandr's career, he did everything you could ask a fighter to do, and he didn't complain. Tyson Fury fancies himself a road warrior because he beat Klitschko in Dusseldorf and he beat Wilder in America. But Oleksandr Yusik has won more titles on the road, more times than Tyson Fury. Krzysztof Glavatsky, Poland, Mayris Bredis in Latvia, Murat Gassiev in Russia, Anthony Joshua in the United Kingdom. And he never once let that turn him into a blowhard or a prima donna like how Tyson Fury is a prima donna. He's made all the sacrifices you could ask a fighter to make. He's revealed that he actually missed the birth of his daughter on January 28th while training overseas for this fight, which was then postponed. Usyk is now going home to meet her, spend a few days there, and then return to camp to prepare for the new date of May 18th. The new date was scheduled in a timely fashion, and I'm very thankful for that, but if it was scheduled in a timely fashion, it's for good reason. But the reason, the real reason that stands behind it if, is the IBF. Because we all know that IBF has been extending its mandatory for so long, making this uh, undisputed fight uh, go, that at some point it will be impossible uh, to, to move them. So uh, there was a kind of, uh, kind of agreement that uh, IBF will allow 90 days extension in case of an injury, which actually occurred. So that's why uh, May 18th is the is the date. So I would say it's it's the reason. Of course, from from the perspective of let's say future and uh, perfect timing for Fury for Usyk to recover and to come back to the fight, probably the end of the year would be better. But then we had to go uh, to get rid of IBF and uh, fighting Hergovic would be a uh, nice option. But you never know how the fight goes, who wins, and blah, blah, blah. So, uh, Saudis didn't want to risk, so they rescheduled it for May 18th. They wanted to ensure that when this fight happens, it still is an undisputed heavyweight title fight for all the marbles, for all the belts. And in order to do that, they had to move quickly, reschedule this fight quickly, within that window, before the IBF's mandate, comes down. In order for the fight to retain all of its historic and intrinsic value, it's not just about watching two very big guys or two very skilled guys lock horns with each other. It's because it's for all the marbles. It's because it's for all the belts. It's because for the first time in a long time, the heavyweight division will see an undisputed champion crowned. In order to do that, they had to move fast. A fact I'm very thankful for, though there still is a feeling that what all of this really is, what it was, was Tyson Fury's attempt to sabotage this fight through some means. It's not whether or not he's actually cut. It's not a question of the cut being real or not being real. It's how it happened. Did he, through some method, uh, some means, set it up so where he'd get cut and then he'd be able to pull out of this fight. What Team Usyk believes, Igis Klimas, Usyk's longtime manager, he's been very vocal about it. He's not pulling any punches. He believes that Tyson Fury has been trying to get out of this. And to that, they're the ones who came up with the contingency. They're the ones who came up with the idea that whosoever withdraws from this fight should have to pay a $10 million penalty out of their own pocket. In this case, if 
Tyson is not gonna be able to come to May 18th. Alexander gonna fight no matter what on that date, which is uh, His Excellency guaranteed that. And then we asked, we said, we wanted to put penalty if Tyson is not coming. So, but they turn around and they said, the penalty then it has to come from both sides. It cannot be come from one side. So, actually that came from our side to put that into the into the contract. And just to confirm for people who maybe haven't seen some of the other videos that it would go from the fighter as well. It wouldn't be something that's paid for by Saudi Arabia. It would come direct from each fighter. Directly. That is, has to come directly from the fighter. From his next purse or, or, or previous purse or whatever is going to happen. But the fighter must... It, 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 it will come from a fighter's purse. Initially, I thought it was His Excellency that put that penalty in play. That if anybody pulls out, it's going to cost them a lot of money. Well, apparently, it came from Team Usyk. That's their insurance. Their insurance policy that this fat bag of milk doesn't waste their time again. That if he has half a mind and has the nerve to pull some crap. Any stunts, any shenanigans, if you don't fight in May for any reason, you're out $10 million. So fuck around, fuck around. It's at your peril, my friend. My honest opinion is that the cut is deliberate. My honest opinion is that Tyson Fury was trying to get out of this. I don't know exactly how he pulled it off. I don't know if he paid a sparring partner to do it. Did he instruct him to cut him? I don't know. But what I do know is I don't trust Tyson Fury. I don't think he's ever wanted this fight. And I think this was an attempt to get out of it and it didn't work. He thought that this would kill the fight and it didn't. Pretty nasty looking cut. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 Has a situation like that ever happened to you in a training camp? No. Yeah, because no, you, you, you have the headgears on. I, I don't see how you got hit like that if, you know, because the headgears, will be thick enough to, they, before they hit you in your eye, to hit the pass. It's probably, it's probably good. You know, the, nowadays, I mean, it closes up really good. The stitches are going to be out in a week. You know, it'll heal. They'll put vitamin E on it. You know, they'll, uh, they'll heal it. I think three months is, uh, I think it'll be sufficient for sure. How does it change a fighter's preparation, particularly when you, you consider that, you know, the, the fight is three months away? How will that change, particularly well, the early part of his game? If you, if you go by what Tyson has said, and now this is only by what we hear him say, you know, that four or five weeks, that's enough training, you know, no problem. So he'll spar the last month leading up to the fight and the other two months maybe just be in the gym and not sparring. So it really won't be affecting the eye. Um, I don't see it as being uh, an issue. I mean, Foreman and, Foreman and Ali, you know, were postponed. Uh, a month, I think. It was only a month. I don't know how bad the cut was uh, with Foreman, but it was postponed a month and was never a factor in the fight. There are fights where guys have been cut in the fight where the cut wasn't a factor in the fight. So, you know, like it, uh, who knows? Uh, and then there's the, the Wallen fight where he was bleeding all over the place for every round. He, you don't know, but um, I think if he took it on three months, he must know and have gotten the, the right advice that he's ready to go. Russ Amber, who's been in this game a long time, seen a lot of guys, seen a lot of cuts. It's not going to seem like much to him, but I think that it's something for Oleksandr Yusik to target. That whether you think Tyson Fury did this deliberately to get out of the fight, or you think, no, it's just a freak accident and these things happen, irrespective of what you believe. It's something for Oleksandr Yusik to target. Conspiracy theories aside, that's the takeaway. Irrespective of how it got there, it's there, and it's something that Oleksandr Yusik can exploit. Now, I already had Oleksandr Yusik winning the fight before the cancellation, before the sparring rumors about Fury getting worked and Fury getting dropped by Jai Opataya, the same rumors that Johnny Nelson was talking about before the fight got postponed. I already had Oleksandr Yusik winning. Cut over his eye just makes me that much more confident. That's just one more thing that Oleksandr Yusik can exploit because Fury's real bread and butter for all these years, his real bread and butter has been his movement and his boxing. And he does move well for a man his size, but it's all relative. He doesn't actually move better than Oleksandr Yusik. He's not as balanced, not as coordinated. He doesn't actually do anything better than Oleksandr Yusik. And for those of you out there who may have 
missed my previous video, how do I reconcile thinking that Fury deliberately cut himself somehow, some way? How do you reconcile saying that Fury sabotaged the fight when you see the condition of the man, that he was so clearly getting ready for something, he's more fit and trim than we've seen him? in recent memory and the way i reconcile it is maybe when he went into the camp he was gonna do the Usyk fight but he starts getting worked and sparring he's getting dropped he's losing confidence and he's not feeling it and he wants to pull out don't expect me to believe the cover story whenever it comes to tyson fury don't expect me to trust him and take his word for it because i won't and i don't he has a knack to getting out of things like never getting around to fighting David Price, his domestic rival, at the time, pulling out on Pulev, pulling out on Ustinov, pulling out on the Klitschko rematch, he never got around to that. He delayed what was supposed to be the Wilder rematch. Remember, there's a year in between the first fight and the second fight. Head of what was supposed to be the second fight, he decides to ditch Wilder, jumps into bed with top rank, complicating things, and thereby delaying the second fight. I mean, Tyson Fury has a knack for being an obstruction artist because that's what he does. He wastes people's time. But this time, when things first collapsed in Saudi and they decided they were gonna try to do the fight in the UK, in Wembley, don't you see all the roadblocks and obstacles that he was putting up? It's gotta be a 70-30 split. And you've gotta give me an answer by this time frame, by this deadline, and I'm taking out the rematch clause. And all of it was happening in full view of the public guy when if Tyson Fury was serious about making that fight you're not gonna upload five and six and seven videos to your social media trying to cultivate favor from the public when none of this is supposed to be public it's supposed to be happening behind closed doors on amicable terms and the terms you set were anything but amicable because you never wanted this fight and you don't fool me never wanted this fight I don't think he wants it now I think the cut However it got there, it wasn't an accident. It was by design. It was deliberate. How we did it? I don't know exactly, but take a look. Take a good long look at Tyson Fury's career so far. All of the withdrawals, all the pullouts, and all the controversy. And you tell me if he doesn't have a penchant, if he doesn't have a knack for getting out of things. What I think separates this situation from every situation before it, is this situation comes with a penalty attached. You don't get to skate. You don't sail off into the sunset without it costing you something. I heard Tyson Fury say, why would he want to bail on the biggest fight of his career? Why would he want to bail on all of that money? Need I remind you that there was a time when the Klitschko rematch was the biggest fight of his career. There was a time when that was the most money that he could have made. And he still bailed. He still pulled out because he was mentally unfit at a very convenient time for him to be quote unquote mentally unfit when you owe Klitschko a rematch and you're being investigated by the BBBOC because you tested positive finandrolone it all happened at a very convenient time for Tyson Fury just like this cut happened at a very convenient time I see the pattern if you want to believe the cover story go ahead but don't expect me to do that I don't believe a word this guy says